Welcome back to The Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are on the episode number 34. In the previous episode, we saw that the four great instruments that supports our journey of self-realization. First was knowledge, second, the practice, the effort, third, the teacher, fourth, the time, of which we began elaborating, Sri Aurobindo began elaborating on the knowledge part. And he also brought this picture of the agency of word is what awakens the soul. And this word can come from within or from outside. And this agency is only awakening what is already contained within us. Both knowledge as well as perfection, it is already there. The agency awakens it and it opens up petal by petal. For rare individuals, inner word is sufficient for vast majority in external word, the form of a scripture or a major influence of a teacher is necessary. And when it is a well-trodden path from the past, it gives you a safe passage and well-explored goal and well-established practices. However, it is a narrow process because the divine is constantly remolding and reshaping the world. And uh, let's now proceed on to what he is taking us into. If it is not the traditional scriptures, they have a place, teachers, they have a place. Where is he taking us? If this is a narrow approach, what is the next? This will be explored in this episode. Let's read. And uh, in the description, you will find the link to this chapter. We will be <coughs> reading chapter uh, 4 aids and paragraph number 7. That's where we are starting. For the sadhaga of integral yoga, it is necessary to remember that no written shastra, however great its authority, or however large its spirit, can be more than a partial expression of the eternal knowledge. Very important statement. There is this eternal knowledge and perfection. Whatsoever be the way it finds expression in the world, it will always be a partial expression. And whenever we take a scripture from the past, it was an expression meant for a particular period of time. And it has its limitation and applicability to that particular period of time. Even when its spirit is large. This point we must remember. For the sadhaka of integral yoga, it is necessary to remember that no written shastra, however great its authority, however large its spirit, can be more than a partial expression of the eternal knowledge. We have to acknowledge this fact that it is always a partial expression of the eternal knowledge. And with that understanding, we approach the scriptures, however great the authority it is, and however large its spirit is. He will use, but never bind himself, even by the greatest scripture. Radical statements. Yet, that's what Sri Aurobindo is. He is very radical. So he is saying, 
he will use but never bind himself even by the greatest scripture so a sadhak of integral yoga need not bind himself to any scripture even if it is the greatest of all scriptures where the scripture is profound wide catholic it may exercise upon him an influence for the highest good and of incalculable importance so shirobindo is not saying it is of no value it has an incalculable importance it can bring great influence so when especially when the scripture is profound wide and catholic this may in exercise upon him an influence for the highest good it can bring great good on the sadhaka and of incalculable importance it may be associated in his experience with his awakening to crowning varieties and his realization of the highest experience so the scripture may be related it can be associated with in his experience with his awakening to crowning varieties there is this experience with his awakening to crowning varieties and his realizations of the highest experience when we are going through the journey of self realization and inner awakening many experiences come and many of the scriptures may be associated with that awakening of the experience and that is a perfect possibility and very valid possibility so where the scripture is profound wide and catholic it may exercise upon him an influence for the highest good and of incalculable importance his yoga may be governed for a long time by one scripture by or by several successively if it is in the line of the great hindu tradition by the gita for example the upanishads the veda or it may be a good part of his development to include in his material a richly varied experience of the truths of many scriptures and make the future opulent with all that is best in the past in hindu traditions we have a huge body of inherited knowledge and scriptures vedas the upanishads the gita three outstanding body of knowledge this may bring in great influence in one's awakening so his yoga here he is the sadhaka his yoga may be governed for a long time by one scripture or by several successively so we can see people taking up the gita going deep into it then taking up upanishads going deep into it even within upanishads there are many of them one by one one can take up successively going into the depth of the scriptures and reaffirming the experience represented by the scriptures these are all part of the process his yoga may be governed for a long time by one scripture or by several successively if it is in the line of the great hindu tradition by the gita for example the upanishads the veda or it may be a good part of his development to include in its material a richly varied experience of the truths of many scriptures and make the future opulent with all that is best in the past so one can also bring in multiple scriptures to have a rich variety of perspectives and experiences in one's own journey all that is gathered in the past can be assimilated by the present sadhaks but in the end he must take his station 
or better still, if he can, always and from the beginning, he must live in his own soul, beyond the limitations of the word that he uses. So on one hand, the word is the agency of awakening. On the other hand, one must go beyond the word one uses, whether it is inheritance from the past and its scriptures and a particular expression we find in the scriptures, all that are very, very helpful. But eventually one must transcend the word and start living in one's soul beyond the word that is formed, articulated in the past. Live in the experience of the soul. This is the most important thing for a sadhak. So in the end, he must take his station, or better still, if he can, always. And from the beginning, from the beginning, learning to live one's own soul, from the beginning, he must live in his own soul beyond the limitations of the word he uses. You may use a scripture, you may use a word to enter into experience, but one must transcend the word and enter into the experience of that which the word represents. The Gita itself thus declares that the yogin in his progress must pass beyond the written truth. Shabda Brahma Adi Vartate Shabda Brahma Adi Vartate Beyond all that he has heard and all that he, ha he has yet to hear. Shrodas Shrodavyasya Shrutasya Cha Shrodavyasya Shrutasya Cha That is beyond all that he has heard and all that he, is, he has yet to hear. So one must go beyond the word. No matter how profound a scripture is and how profound the word that you heard, one has to transcend the word and unpack it and enter into the experience and live in the soul of it. Gita itself thus declares that the yogin in his progress must pass beyond the written truth. Shabda Brahmati Vartate, beyond all that he has heard and all that he has yet to hear. Srota Vyasya Srutasya Cha. For he is not the sadhaka of a book or of many books. He is a sadhaka of the infinite. So we are not a sadhak of a book or many books, but sadhak of the infinite itself. The divine who is eternal and infinite. That is our central focus and it is inexhaustible. No matter how profound a scripture is, it is only a partial expression of that infinity. And we must always remember that we are the sadhakas of that infinity, not sadhaka bound by a specific scripture or many scriptures. So for he is not the sadhaka of a book or of many books, he is the he is a sadhaka of the infinite. Another kind of shastra is not scripture, but a statement of the science and methods, the effective principles and the way of working of the path of yoga, which the sadhaka effects to follow. Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, for example, it's a science and method of entering into inner realization. So that's the type of scripture. So another kind of scripture, it's not, it's, no, another kind of shastra is not scripture, but a statement of the science and methods 
the effective principles and the way of working of the path of yoga, which the sadhaka elects to follow. So there is scriptures and then there is the scientific methods and processes. So some books are giving the methods and processes. Some are giving the philosophical truths and the experiences, illustrating the experiences that one goes through and illustrating the nature of reality, truth of reality, and some focus on the method of accessing that reality. So another kind is of Shastra is not scripture, but statement of the science and methods, the effective principles and way of working of the path of yoga, which the sadhaka elects to follow. Each path has its Shastra, either written or traditional, passing from mouth to mouth through a long line of teachers. So this had been the case in India, from teacher to student, generation after generation, the knowledge was transmitted initially as oral tradition and then increasingly in the written form. So each path in India has, India we have a large number of paths. Each path has its own Shastra, either written or traditional, passing from mouth to mouth through a long line of teachers. In India, a great authority, a high reverence, even is ordinarily attached to the written or traditional teaching. Wherever you go in India, spiritual institutions, you will find the great reverence given to the traditional teachings and scriptures and teachers. So this is very common. A high reverence even is ordinarily attached to the written or traditional teaching. All the lines of the yoga are supposed to be fixed and the teacher who has received the Shastra by tradition and realized it in practice guides the disciple along the immemorial tracks. So once a founding yogi discovers a path, and codifies the method and process and hand it over generation after generation. Hundreds of yogins follow and it become a well-established path and that become a scriptural standing book which is highly revered and repeatedly used to re-establish, reconfirm that experience and the validity of the path. You follow the process, reaffirm in your own experience what was gathered by the original founding members. And many traditions build on it layer after layer because every new traveler discovers something new. So all the lines of yoga are supposed to be fixed and the teacher who has received the Shastra by tradition and realized it in practice, guides the disciple along the immemorial tracks. So many of the paths are almost like fixed. So this is the full realization, there is nothing beyond it. And you, every follower is trying to arrive at that one particular experience and reaffirm through one's own experience, what that particular school represent. And it is an immemorial track where hundreds and thousands of yogins have walked. One often even hears the objection urged against a new practice, a new yogic teaching, the adaptation, the adoption of a new formula. It is not according to the Shastra. So when people are bound to specific tradition, especially when it is really old and thousands have validated, tested and proven the experience, it is well established, well known. Then when a new teaching comes, then you have to face the objection that it is not according to Shastra because you are 
developing something new which is not in alignment with the Shastra. And that is also very common to be found in traditional pathways. One often even hears the objection urged against a new practice, a new yogic teaching, the adoption of a new formula. It is not according to the Shastra. But neither in fact nor in the actual practice of yogins is there any, really any such entire rigidity of an iron door shut against new truth, fresh revelation, widened experience. So in the actual practice of yoga, such iron doors really doesn't exist. That prevents you from having new experiences, new wider experiences, new realizations, new discovery, new truth. This is always possible in the actual practice of yoga. So neither in fact or in the actual practice of yogins is there any is there really any such entire rigidity. No such rigidity is to be held. And in the practice, you cannot have such a rigidity. Of an iron door shut against new truth, fresh revelation, widened experience. Especially when the world is evolving, collectivity is evolving. There is always a new expression of the eternal truth. The written or traditional teaching expresses the knowledge and experience of many centuries, systematized, organized, made attainable to the beginner. It is, its importance and utility are, of, are therefore immense. So there is tremendous utility for that systematized knowledge body of knowledge gathered, systematized, organized by the yogins who went before us, they have given us a huge body of inherited wisdom, systematized, and it has great importance and tremendous value. It is not to be put down. It is our stepping stone. These are the great pathways already well-tested and proven, which can be utilized. Its importance and utility are therefore immense. But a great freedom of variation and development is always practicable. That is something we need to keep in mind. A great freedom of variation, whatever be the pathway and practice we follow, a great freedom of variation from what is established and development, variation and development is always practicable. As I mentioned, because the world is changing, social context is changing, variations will be always necessary. Even so highly scientific a system as Raja Yoga can be practiced on other lines than, organize, than the organized method of Patanjali. So this is Patanjali's Yoga Sutra and the Raja Yoga method is one of the most popular and well-established path. And it is perfectly possible to practice Raja Yoga in ways that are quite different from the methods given by Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras. So one must be open to the variations and possibilities. Even so highly scientific a system as Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga is highly scientific, systematized, rational, organized, can be practiced on other lines than the original organized method of Patanjali. Each of the three paths of the Trimarga, Trimarga is path of knowledge, path of works, path of love, breaks into many bypaths which meet again at the goal. So, Trimarga, these three pathways have many sub pathways. They will eventually all come together again at the goal. The general knowledge on which yoga depends is fixed. The general knowledge on which yoga depends is fixed. But the order, the succession, the devices, the forms, 
must be allowed to vary for the needs and particular impulsion of the individual nature have to be satisfied even while the general truths remain firm and constant. So there is the goal of yoga, of self-realization, self-transformation, that remains fixed. But the process, the methods, the sequence, the order in which a practice is developed, we must be open to a great deal of variation in it because each individual is unique. And there is a, an evolutionary path to the individual, certain formation within the individual. So corresponding adoption is necessary. And on the top of it, social transformation is also continuously evolving. So there must be an adaptation of the methods. So the general knowledge on which yoga depends is fixed. General knowledge, that's fixed. But the order, the succession, the devices, the forms. Order, the succession, the devices, the forms must be allowed to vary. For the needs and particular impulsion, particular impulsion of the individual nature have to be satisfied even while the general truths remain firm and constant. So that degree of flexibility we need to keep in mind when adapting, when looking at the paths that are available to us, the methods that are available to us, even when we are developing a method for us in our own journey. This flexibility, while general truth of yoga is fixed, the methods vary. An integral and synthetic yoga needs especially not to be bound by any written or traditional shastra. For while it embraces the knowledge received from the past, it seeks to organize it anew for the present and the future. The yoga Sri Aurobindo is bringing in is integral yoga. It is a yoga that is a synthesis of the very essence of all yogic traditions. While it embraces all yogic pathways of the past, it is also at the same time reorganizing and rearticulating in new ways and in new forms the eternal truth because of our collective evolution and the stage we have reached and it requires new forms of expression. So it's not binding to the traditional pathways. There is something new that is getting added to the entire evolutionary journey. Therefore, an integral and synthetic yoga needs especially not to be bound by any written or traditional shastra. Written or traditional shastra. What we need to remember while respecting and honoring every great scripture is that these scriptures, these great teachings from the past, emerged in a social context, part of a particular collective evolution, and the very forms in which it is cast was meant for that particular period of time. While essential truth is eternal, the outer form of expression was belonging to that particular period of human history or national history. So this historic outer layer has to be recognized and we need to go into the essential eternal truth and it has to be given modern contemporary expressions so that the truth revives itself with a fresh lease of life in whole new form. And this had been happening throughout the last 5,000 
years of India's spiritual development. The Vasavedic tradition, Vedas are expressed in certain way. Then that knowledge was lost and again it was re recovered and given new form in the Upanishads. Then again it was given new later form in the Gita. Meanwhile, parallelly many other new religions that emerged all gave new forms, the Vedanta. Then later, Tantra, Puranas, they all took new expressions, new forms to the very ancient eternal truth. So there is a constant renovation, renewal, rejuvenation, recasting, which we must keep in mind. Needs to especially not to be bound by any written or traditional Shastra for, for while it embraces the knowledge received from the past, our integral yoga embraces the knowledge received from the past, it seeks to organize it anew for the present and the future. There is a present day reality and there is an emerging future requirements. So accordingly, there is a recasting of the ancient knowledge. But in order to recast, first, first, first one must have the inner experience in its richness, in its fullness. Then only one has the adhikara, the authority, the right to actually recast, even the capacity to recast. An absolute liberty of experience and of the restatement of knowledge in new terms and new combinations is the conditions of its self-formation. The self-formation of the new yoga, this integral yoga, what Sri Aurobindo is bringing in, demands an absolute liberty of experience. First condition, absolute liberty of experience. Unless we have experience, there is no true knowledge. And experience we need not limit to anything that is already well established and well known. There must be an absolute liberty so that one can explore the unexplored. So an absolute liberty of experience and of the restatement of knowledge. Knowledge thus gained through experience, we can restate in new forms. In new terms and new combinations is the condition of its self-formation. There is a self-formation. It, it is born from the self and it gives itself a form suitable to the time period in which this revelation, the new revelation, new expression takes its birth. Seeking to embrace all life in itself, it is in the position not of a pilgrim following the high road to his destination, but to that extent at least of a pathfinder hewing his way through a virgin forest. Here new imagery is brought in. You are also a pathfinder because in the course of yoga, there is a progression in the yogic or spiritual evolution of individual and the collective. And in nature's evolution, nature adds new layers, new possibilities, and that requires pathfinding towards it. This is where there is an exploration of a virgin forest that is the imagery Sri Aurobindo is bringing in, pathfinder hewing his way through a virgin forest. So let me read this again. Seeking to embrace all life in itself, it is the position, it is in the position not of a pilgrim following the high road to his destination. A pilgrim is following a path that is already well laid to a specific destination. Path is known, destination is known. Whereas, when a new layer in the evolution is to be added, path is unknown, even the form it takes 
is unknown. So there is a pathfinder's work there. So Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga is essentially looking at, on one hand, embracing all that is inherited from the past. On the other hand, what is in store in future? What is the new step in evolution that nature is attempting through humanity at this juncture of time? And that requires hewing the path towards that unknown destination. It's not repeating the past experiences as it is, but assimilating them and going beyond them to the contemporary challenges of human collective evolution. Seeking to embrace all life in itself, it is in the position not of a pilgrim following the high road to his destination, but to that extent at least of a pathfinder hewing his way through a virgin forest, a forest that is unexplored. For yoga has long diverged from life and the ancient systems which sought to embrace it, such as those of our Vedic forefathers, are far away from us, expressed in terms which are no longer accessible, thrown into forms which are no longer applicable. This is the challenge. The yoga has long diverged from life. That's why in India we see the life negating spirituality, which publicly declares that life is on the one hand misery and the world is an illusion. Purpose of yoga is to end the cycle of rebirth and liberate us from this misery, this illusion. And thus, yoga diverged from life by rejecting life. On the other hand, we have very, very ancient yoga, yoga of the Vedic rishis, who embraced life in its totality. But the expressions of the Veda are so remote, they, are, they lived so long, long, long ago, their expressions are inaccessible to it. Even the form of their practices are not applicable in the contemporary modern context. Let me read this again. Yoga has long diverged from life. And the ancient systems which sought to embrace it, embracing life, such as those of our Vedic forefathers, are far away from us, expressed in terms which are no longer accessible. It's hard to comprehend the Vedic form of yoga. When we study the Vedas, the symbolism, the language, it is so mystical. What is the underlying truth behind it? For a moderner, it is impossible to penetrate and get into. A yogi can enter and recover the knowledge. Then it has to be given a new form. The old forms in which it was cast and the forms of application that are suitable for that period is not necessarily applicable in our modern context. Expressed in terms which are no longer accessible, thrown into forms which are no longer applicable. Since then, mankind has moved forward on the current of eternal time, and the same problem has to be approached from a new starting point. So in today's era of artificial intelligence and explosion of technologies, modern science, this is the modern context. And yoga has to reinvent itself, reimagine itself, recast itself. And that's a challenge. There is a whole new starting point for yoga. There is an intensity of materialism. There is a truth of the matter that is to be integrated into the yogic realm. Since then, since then here is 
from the Vedic days. Since then, mankind has moved forward on the current of eternal time. Current of eternal time. There is a stream of time in which society is flowing and evolving. Various cycles of civilization have come and gone. And society is evolving. By the way, my film uh, called Evolution Fast Forward Part 4, which is dealing with the spiritual history of India, tracking how the forms, how, how India evolved, how the soul of India evolved, and in different periods, how it expressed the ancient knowledge in new ways. So if you have not seen that video, I would highly recommend you watch that video. The mankind has moved forward on the current of eternal time and the same problem has to be approached from a new starting point. Integral yoga is a new starting point where the material and spiritual are to be brought together. A life affirmate, affirming spirituality, not life negating spirituality. By this yoga, we do not only seek the infinite, but we call upon the infinite to unfold himself in human life. Call upon the infinite to unfold here upon human life. So on one hand, we seek the infinite, then we bring the infinite into our human life to transform earthly life. This is where it differs from the liberation spirituality which considers earth and life as misery and an illusion from which where we need to exit. That's a life-negating spirituality. Our yoga is not only seek the infinite, but we call upon the infinite to unfold himself in human life. Therefore, the shastra of our yoga must provide for an infinite liberty in the receptive human soul. So there must be the Shastra of our yoga, the science, the body of knowledge of our yoga must provide an infinite variety in the receptive human soul. It has to be supple, flexible and of infinite variety. A free adaptability in the manner and the type of the individual's acceptance of the universal and transcendent into himself is the highest condition for the full spiritual life in man. A free adaptability in the manner and type, adapting the infinity, the infinite, the eternal, the universal, is pouring into the individual mold and the individual mold must be able to adapt to that pouring. Free adaptability in the manner and type of individual's acceptance of the universal and transcendent into himself is the right condition for the full spiritual life in man. So, that to which we are opening will be pouring into us and that will shape and decide and infinite variety of methods and processes will be unfolding naturally. And that's... Uh, right condition. That's the way this yoga can unfold. Vivekananda pointing out that the unity of all religions must necessarily express itself by an increasing richness of variety in its forms, said once that the perfect state of that essential unity would come when each man had his own religion. When not bound by sect or traditional form, he followed the free self-adaptation of his nature in his relations with the Supreme. Usually when we say religion, we think of three, four major religions. The deeper truth as we go spiritually evolved, 
as we spiritually evolve is to really see that each person has his own religion. Here the word religion does not mean any of the traditional forms. It is your direct approach to the divine. So Swami Vivekananda says that's a condition for that tremendous diversity to emerge in the world. The unity of all religion must necessarily express itself by an increasing richness and variety of its forms. On one hand, there is a unity. On the other hand, there is a tremendous diversity. Only when we root ourselves in unity, the diversity can thrive. The experience of unity can have infinite variations because we are dealing with the infinity itself. If we limit it to one particular pathway, one particular mold, one particular understanding, we create the fanatic sectarian religions that block human evolution. So an integral approach must open itself to this vast possibility of each person having their own way of entering the infinity, connecting to the universal and transcendent. Let me read this line once again. Vivekananda pointing out that the unity of all religions must necessarily express itself by an increasing richness of variety in its forms, said once that the perfect state of that essential unity perfect state of that essential unity would come when each man had his own religion, when not bound by sect or traditional form, he followed the free self-adaptation of his nature in his relations with the Supreme. Each individual has a relationship with the Supreme, that highest state of being. And there is a self-adaptation to that because each individual is unique, absolutely unique. Therefore, the nature of self-adaptation will be unique. And this is something very central we need, must recognize and acknowledge. So also, one may say that the perfection of the integral yoga will come when each man is able to follow his own path of yoga. Pursuing the development of his own nature in its upsurging towards that which transcends the nature. So integral yoga is in that line. Eventually each person will have their own unique path to walk. In that upsurging of the individual soul and its movement towards union with the divine consciousness. In that and that self-adaptation to the process, they will be absolutely unique path for each individual to follow. Even if there is a general broad guideline that is applicable to everyone, eventually each one will have their own unique path, specific set of practices that are adapted to that specific individual. So also, one may say that the perfection of integral yoga will come when each man is able to follow his own path of yoga, pursuing the development of his own nature in its upsurging towards that which transcends the nature. For freedom is the final law and the final consummation. Freedom, the nature of the spiritual existence is of absolute freedom. So there is this, freedom is the final law and last consummation. We enter into infinity of freedom. That, the very law of freedom, that's the very nature of this deepest, highest reality. And it will find its expression in our life. Meanwhile, certain general lines have to be formed which may help to guide the thought and practice of the sadhaka. General lines. But these must take as much as possible the form of 
general truths, general statements of principle, the most powerful broad directions of effort and development, rather than a fixed system which has to be followed as a routine. So Sri Aurobindo is very careful from the very beginning to not to create a fixed system and a routine because the tendency is that eventually it will fossilize, freeze and become a religion. Things become a fixed mold and lose its relevance as society evolves. To prevent that fossilization, for the truth to revive itself and remain fresh, better avoid that fixed routine system that everyone must follow exactly. Instead, lay down the general broad lines and directions. These must take as much as possible the form of general truths, general statements of principle. Statements of principle. The most powerful broad directions of effort and development rather than a fixed system which has to be followed as a routine. All Shastra is the outcome of past experience and a help to the future experience. It's an aid and a partial guide. So we acknowledge that all Shastra is an outcome of past experience. It will definitely help us in the future experience, but it's only an aid and a partial guide. It puts up signposts, gives the names of the main roads and the already explored directions so that the traveler may know whither and by what path he is proceeding. So that's the function of the Shastra. It puts up the signboards, point the roads, main pathways to take so that the traveler on the path would know where he is, where he is going. That's its role. So it's an aid and a partial guide. It puts up signposts, gives names of the main roads and the already explored directions so that the traveler may know whether, whether and by what paths he is proceeding. So you will find in various practices, various stages of growth marked at this stage, this will be the experience, at this stage, this will be the experience, at this stage, this will be so and so, so that you can validate through your own experience what past yogins have gathered and given. And even in this integral yoga, articulation of the broad general directions and the methods and principles, not a fixed system to be followed, it gives you the road signs and the pathways to take and know where you are in the journey. But exact methods, everyone has to fine tune or design on the way. And that will be done by the great wisdom that takes you up in the process the divine teacher secretly dwelling within you and in all will shape you and will give you the methods suitable for your particular period of journey, particular personal requirement. The rest depends upon personal effort and experience and upon the power of the guide. So the Shastra can provide broad signposts, roadways to take and name them, show them this is the way to go. Actually walk on the path, there is the personal effort and experience and upon the power of the guide who will be leading you on the path. So that's where the strength and limitation of the Shastra is, the written Shastras. And what Sri Aurobindo recommends is to go for the Shastra that is the eternal Veda secret in the heart of every thinking and living beings. That is ever fresh. That's the true knowledge, source of knowledge and from there everything comes. Then there is a well-established traditional pathway, scriptures or that 
which are partial expressions which will help, but we must be careful, we must be uh, aware that there is a limitation. These are all partial expressions that are always new articulation, new expression possible. And therefore, integral yoga need to look at the broad directions to walk, not a routine system. And the rest is our personal effort and experience, and of course, the power of the guide. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. Please do share your feedback, your suggestions, your insights, and also ensure you have signed up for this channel so that you get the notifications. See you next week. Thank you.